Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 11, The Worst of the Worst. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions, and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone hanging out in the chat room, the lobby here on Twitch. It's a pleasure to see people interested. For those listening to the podcast, you can join us live every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Audience feedback. Don't read this. Damn, failed. <laughs> I don't see why not. It's the intro to the section. All right. I'm like, it didn't say that yesterday. I guess we could not read that. I'm like, I'm used to reading it. I'm like, it says do not read this. Oh, well, I read it. It's getting read. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive or negative. Most of the feedback we got from last episode were about our technical issues. And boy, did we have a lot of them. Turns out that Discord uses a lot of your processor on video chat. And you can't really stream when your processor is sucked up just talking back and forth between Mo and I. So, we did a little bit of testing, worked out the kinks, found out that Skype is our friend, and after a, a night of playing games and uh, chatting online, we figured out it out, and we replayed for a retake of last episode on Saturday night. Now we're back up and running. Besides that, though, it was a quiet week. Uh, most of the feedback I got were people commenting on how many of the top 20 they played. And for the most part, it was very few, which I was a little surprised. People were like, oh, I've only played three of those or four of those. Now, I do realize that I have quite a few older games on my list, and many of them are out of uh, many of them are out of print. Yeah, I'm not really into the whole cult of the new. I do like new games. I do like to play new games. But to me, it's just a new game being a game I haven't played before. It doesn't have to be something that was released in 2018. I'm perfectly happy to have played Bruges for the first time last year. And that's a much older game. Well, you know, sometimes you need to let the bugs get worked out on their own. And you can uh, start playing it once everyone else has figured out the problems. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like us to let, uh, and if you'd like to let us know yeah, something about the show, send your feedback to Mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or Sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S E A N. You can also contact us over social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and uh, you can find us on <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, G Plus, and as of last week, Me We, where it seems to be the promised land for those fleeing G plus and now tabletop gaming weekly where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year what games hit the bellhops tabletop every week i like to take a look back at the games we played any events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on you can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com now, we still haven't gotten my Monday night group back together. Um, I think the fact we got seven people, the entire group together, that one day, like the first week Jamie was supposed to come, I think that broke something because we actually haven't gotten back together since, which kind of stinks. Hopefully, well, this Monday there was a good reason. Gobble, gobble. But um, most of my gaming during the week then was, again, through Board Game Arena. Uh, you've tempted the, uh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Is not it? nearly as nice a flow. Anyway, so you tempted the fates by getting your whole group together yeah, and what happens it. just like when you tempt the fakes with Skype, you lose. That's true. Only tempt the fates when actually playing a role playing game. So uh, I do have to give a shout out to Stephanie Franklin. Uh, Eric Franklin's the one that got me into board game arena got me really, uh, introduced me to it and kind of taught me how to use it. Well, I was playing games with him and he was asking why and she games doesn't play with us. So we tried to get her set up. So once we got her set up, we tried to set up a game together, just a two player race for the galaxy. And it ends up that board game arena really doesn't like two people using the same IP at all. 
So as soon as we tried to do this, we got all these errors. Well, first off, you get all these warnings. And it's like, warning, don't make two accounts. Don't cheat. Don't play against yourself. And they're like, yeah, okay, we won't. Let's go. And then they're like, oh, you need a premium account to be able to play two accounts from the same house. So then Eric's being a smart guy and all is like, well, just have D log into the game on her phone and then switch over to the PC to play, which surprisingly worked. So we were able to get some games in, but really we're kind of circumventing the system. So then we got talking and he said, you know what? Uh, Stephanie's got a gift for you. That's Eric's wife. And they gifted me with a, a premium account. So thank you very much, Eric and Stephanie. It is appreciated. Now, having that, we can now play games with Anchi Games, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. And so, uh, while we all understand the potential for using two accounts to operate yourself and skew the statistics, there is a, uh, a gifting and a, a various uh, ranking systems within, uh, within Board Game Arena. At the same time, it's really not rocket science to make sure that you, you at least have two separate people for a real account. And, you know, anyway, we should be past this yeah. sort of thing now. Well, just like the uni- uh, just like the interface, board game arena does feel a little dated at times. So, well, the good thing about this is, along with, along with the usual Seven Wonders, Race for the Galaxy, and I'm still playing a ton of Terra Mystica, we can now play games with D. So, me and her have been playing two player Race for the Galaxy. We played some Takedo, and then we've also started to integrate her in some other games. I think we now are up to what six players in our Seven Wonders game now. Uh, we, yep, six was the last count of uh, the latest game we started. Yep, and then Takedo as well. I think we're up to five players on that. We are, and you know what? Takedo, I love the game. It's it's wonderful. But the five-player version is downright yeah, hard. It's... It takes so long because we're in different time zones. So you sit back down and you're like, oh my, how did I get to the hotel? Yeah. How did I get to the end of the, the section? I don't even remember playing the last move i don't even remember how i got here so that's yeah, we, tough we know board game arena doesn't jump you ahead though it no, should no it won't yeah playing five anything five player and like the game's a terror mystic i'm playing like i think the last one took nine days to finish and like there's no reason it should take that long but we are playing with different groups so uh eric pointed it out i didn't realize all of they're all in seattle so you've got me in Windsor, you in Hamilton, and three of them in Seattle all playing, and D now also from Windsor, which is still pretty cool. So I got to admit, I, it's still worth doing, and it's still fun to do. So Friday, Friday, we did play Gloomhaven. That is Friday nights, now Gloomhaven night. When we first started this podcast, it was uh, Pandemic Legacy night. If we ever finish Gloomhaven, it'll probably be whatever the next legacy game is, because it seems like we've got a legacy game group. Thank you, uh, we, thank you Uncle we, Awesome, for following. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us in the chat as well. So in Gloomhaven, we raided a warehouse, and this time I knew people were coming over, and I had time on Friday. I don't remember why. I don't most weeks, but whatever. I had time to kill. So I got downstairs and got everything set up. And I actually broke out my old Hero Escape, the old Games Workshop Milton Bradley game. I grabbed like the bookcases and everything from that. And I set up this whole warehouse with the 3D scenery. And it looked fantastic. And I put pictures up of it. If you check out the blogs where you can review, you can see the pictures. I posted pictures on Twitter. I'll be posting them on Instagram eventually. It looks so great. And then we're playing and the game's going pretty good. And then and Games points out, she's like, remember, in Gloomhaven, obstacles are everything. So anything that's like a tree, a boulder, a bookshelf, case, a shelf, they all just are obstacles according to the rules. And according to the rules, obstacles block movement but not line of sight. Which man, when you've got scenery of a giant bookcase and you got a miniature in front of it and you obviously the miniature obviously can't see through the bookcase, I totally missed like would have played part of that fight completely differently if I had remembered that these bookcases aren't actually blocking access to the big zombie things that were on the other side. Yeah, it's uh, that's a tough one. Uh. Yeah, it looks cool, but it, well, it's the same problem. When I used to run Dungeons and Dragons, everyone got into 3D scenery for a bit. Everyone was buying the Dar- Dwarven Forge. And one of the problems we found with Dwarven Forge is they have walls. And when you're sitting at the game table, you can't see the fight or the miniatures. you got to stand up. And at, with my game table, that doesn't work so great. So it, it was it was neat. It looked cool, but... I don't know if we'll do as much. You know, I'll probably stage a shot and take a picture. And when everyone shows up, 
they can see it and it will look awesome. And then we'll replace everything with the counters when we actually play. So mechanically, it'll still be obvious what's going well, on. Well, and to be fair, I don't think you'd actually played Gloomhaven Extreme Rules yet. So it had to happen eventually. <laughs> well, it was an extreme rule. We didn't break any rules. It just I was hindering myself more than I should have. Right. It was the opposite of our usual extreme rules. Our usual extreme rules, we do something wrong where it's like you were adding new way rules too much money. Yeah, you were adding yeah, new rules I, that didn't exist. Yes, exactly. I added two types of obstacles because that's the other thing. The last time we played, I did use scenery as well, but the fight was in a bar room with tables, and while well, you can see over the tables, and so I'd never even thought about the fact that tables might have blocked line of sight, which they don't. So, as for the actual game, we won. It was pretty close. Uh, wasn't nail biting, but if we'd gone a round or two more, it would have been bad. Now we're most of us were down to three cards. Uh, if anyone remembers talking about this before, every round you had to play two cards, and if you can't, your character is knocked out, exhausted. So like we're down to three cards. It's like I use those two cards, and then next turn I rest, then I use those two cards, and I'm out, and that's all you'd be able to do. At the end of this, three of us leveled up. So. All but one of us has now hit level two. And with how quick this battle went, we're thinking of stepping up to normal. Now, I've talked about the last couple episodes. You can listen to them, why we're playing on easy and how we made that decision. The other thing that's really cool is the map is really branching out, like a lot. Like, I think we're up to like eight different choices at the start of the next mission. And of those, we've now unlocked two side quests, which are just randomized. Like you grab a deck of cards and put a new sticker on the board at that spot with no telling you what's there at all. So we just like picked this place called like the Windy Peaks. And we're going to go check that out. Excellent. Well, it sounds like, uh, again, we, we talked about it last week, how really that some of the concerns about that initial gameplay was really the, the video game walkthrough version on a board yeah. game. Oh, and thank you, Aaron Lynn, for subscribing. Wow. All right. Um, uh, so once you got through that and now that the game is branching out and, uh, you know, it seems like uh, you've really got a lot to go on. Yeah, I, uh, my overall impression is still about the same. I'm having fun. It's a good game. I still don't think it deserves its number one spot. It's not the best game I played. It's not the best game I own. But it's still solid. It's fun. Now, Tori did note that he's been enjoying it a ton. It's so much better than Pandemic and thinks it's one of the best games he's ever played. So at least there's at least one person out there I know who thinks it does deserve that number one spot. Now, does Tori play a lot of video games? I, some. He is younger, probably a generation below I, I me think, in age. I think that explains it. Um, everything, the more I, and again, I haven't played, gotten to play Gloomhaven yet, but the more I hear about you playing it and, and a lot of the... Uh, mechanics they've got in there they're really driving this towards the rpg diablo mmorpg uh crowd um and it could be that those people are the ones driving the voting yeah. on on board game geek i haven't looked at the the stats there but um That's it, it really seems like they're trying to to cater to that demographic and it, it sounds like it's working yep so I, I don't know how many young people are on board game geek. Maybe a lot more. I generally think of it as a bunch of old grognards, but who knows? That's just the loud ones. Yeah, that's, that's true. They are called grumblers for a reason. So Gloomhaven, as I kind of noted, was a little quick. So we had time. So I broke out St. Saint per Petersburg, second edition. I got that out of the pile of shame, which is my collection of games I haven't played. Um... It has the original rules from the first edition in the box set. And because I haven't played the original version in quite some time, we decided to use the original rules only. That makes sense. It was good. It's the game is as good as I remembered. It's, it's an old Aaliyah big box game that was popular back when Catan was still kind of hot and new. It's not a shiny new game, but it's, it's a new printing of a, of an older game. And I really enjoyed it. So then Saturday, we went down to uh, one of the local game stores for game night, and I was still really hot on St. Petersburg. I had a lot of fun playing it the night before, and I wanted to try the new rules. So we brought that out, set that up on the table, grabbed a couple other players, and we tried it with the new market rules. I really like the new market. It adds a, a economy to the game, something that wasn't in it before. It was mainly set collection and well, economics where you have to manage your own money, but this is more of a commodity market, more of a stock market. And it also added uh, basically an area majority mechanism where whoever's the highest on 
each type of good gets extra points. These were good additions to the game. It didn't make the game less tight. Uh, it was solid. Now, I'm not going to go through the rules of Istanbul. Or Sorry, Istanbul. I'm looking. Uh, my eyes jumped down. That's what we're talking about next. I'm not going to get into the rules of St. Petersburg. If you head over to my Week in Review blog post that went up on Monday, uh, there's a lot more detail there about how the card mechanisms work and exactly what was added. Now, to go back to what I was just saying is Istanbul the dice game. Now, you and D played this at QCC, if I remember correctly. Yes, we did. Uh, this was one of the ones we played while you were off... Uh... Uh, playing one of your one of your RPG adventures, uh, and that we ended up winning and and bringing bringing home with us for the yeah, that's uh, awesome. the, the play and win uh, table, you know, and it was fun. Um, but it turns out from what I learned last week that we weren't doing things quite right, and lo and behold, yeah, the extreme version developed always. It's, it, I swear that's a gaming rule. I don't know whose rule that is. You know, if everyone's going to get rule, maybe mine's the extreme rule. The first time you play a game, it's probably going to be the extreme version. I'm not sure. I, I thought I had a better rule, but that might be more applicable. So, yeah, Deanna had played it with Sean, and I broke out the rules. And the rules are really short, and Dee's not a fan of teaching games, especially with other players there. And it wasn't just me and her. So she asked me if I could read the rules quick, and they're short enough. So I read through, and we started playing. And then after, like, the first turn, Dee's like, wait, you, you don't have to collect the chits to turn them in? And I'm like, no. And we looked through the rules, and sure enough, you could use the dice as commodities. But anyway, I, again, I don't want to get into all... All the rules. You can see that on the blog post. I might have got into detail about it. But I really like the game. That's the important part. It feels a lot like the original Istanbul. I really like the original Istanbul. The original Istanbul is like an hour, hour and a half long Euro game. Tiles where you're moving a merchant around a map and you're assigning your family members to do things. And then you have to go pick them back up to, to collect stuff. It's really well done. This takes that and uses a lot of the same things. So you're trying to buy rubies, and when you buy rubies, the price of rubies goes up, and there's lots of ways to do them. You can buy it through money, or you can buy them through four different goods, and then there's the mosque you can visit to get special powers. All of that's in both games. The difference is this uses dice to do it all instead of being a worker placement game, and you play down in about 20 minutes. It is a very cool filler. Yeah, no, it was it was a fun game, and even playing it the wrong way, where, where I think it, we <laughs> stretched it out a little bit, uh, it was still a quick game, and uh, it just sounds like it's gotten that much more tighter. So then after the game store, I hosted Thanks Gaming. I completely forgot that Monday was Thanksgiving here in Canada. Uh, there was no Turkey Day for us this year. Usually we go to my mother-in-law's, but she was visiting family in the States. And it just kind of, it was a normal weekend. So then I'm like, Friday night, I suddenly realized, and I'm like, oh, wow, it is... Thanksgiving on Monday, which means it should be Thanksgiving this weekend. It's usually a big deal. Like I usually have like 12 to 30 people over and we have pizza and like we game. It's almost not as big as the New Year's party or like my birthday parties, but like we usually have like a, a pretty decent event. So I sent out invites. I did get some bites, but we only ended up with four of us playing games, but we did play four of us playing games for five hours. So I really can't complain. So. I, to me, it's actually messed up my entire week. I knew it was Thanksgiving. We <laughs> did have turkey. We had a fantastic family dinner. Um, but all Tuesday, I was confusing it with Monday, and my schedule has been off. If I didn't have so many alarms set on various devices, I would never have gotten anything right this week because it's just been the wrong day all long, all night, yep. which is really good because otherwise I'd be watching Mr. Directed Mike instead of recording right now. <laughs> Yeah, I remember something came up yesterday. I'm like, hey, you got to check the show notes for the show. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we got till Tuesday. Yeah, I do, I do that got, Tuesdays. I usually do it Tuesday night. And I'm yeah. like, uh, Sean, it is Tuesday <laughs> night. He's like, oh, crap. Yep. I noticed Dark Wolf notes that he played Istanbul for wrong for months. So, yes, there's the extreme version. It's not just us. Yep. Maybe it's a Windsor thing. That's possible. So, back to things gaming. We we had a new guy, a guy I'd never met before was over. So I kind of tried to cater to the new guy, right? I had some friends I game with all the time. So I'm like, what kind of games do you like? He's like, I like interactive co-op games, but not really heavy stuff. So I'm like, well, I don't actually own a lot of co-op games because Anchi Games hates them. So we don't play a lot of them. I do have a few, obviously, but not, not a lot. And he didn't want anything really heavy. Now, I... Personally, I'm rather into heavy games, so I was trying to find something that all four of us, something very interactive, and I grabbed Lanterns, the Harvest Festival from Renegade Games. 
this is one of those games that like sits on my shelf and then I grab it and I play it and I'm like, man, this is such a good game. Why don't I play this more often? And then for the next like four weeks, I'll bring it out to every game night. Be like, well, oh, play Lanterns. Lanterns is so good. And everyone I play with is like, oh, it's so good. And then it goes back on the shelf and I just kind of forget about it. And I had the exact same thing. We played it. I just play with the base rules, uh, the original rules. I have the expansion. This is another one of those games where the expansion to me just bloats the game and doesn't make it any more fun. I actually feel slightly that I wasted my money on that one. Just stick to the base game, in my opinion. Uh, this is a really simple set collection game where you're trying to collect lanterns, and it has a really neat mechanic where you're trying to help yourself without helping your opponents. Uh, again, check out the blog for more details. One of the things I really like on this, though, is that every turn you're involved. So with four players, even while Joe's making his turn, I'm watching to see what Joe does, because based on where Joe plays, I'm also going to get lanterns. So it's a good game to make sure everyone's focused on the table and going. Uh, it's really solid game. Well, and you know, as we've talked about in our tech game, anything you can do to keep people on the game and, and, and away from getting distracted, all the better. So after that, I looked around. I'm like, I got to find a co-op game. That's what Bill wants to play as a co-op game. There's got to be a co-op that's fast, furious fun that I'll enjoy playing and, and it'll get everyone interested, still keep the energy level up. And then I spotted Fuse. So I didn't plan it this way, but it ends up, I guess it's Renegade Games Night, because that's also from Renegade Games. Totally unplanned. Fuse is a super frantic, dice-based, dice-drafting game for four or more players. Now, I mentioned this back on Episode 7, that Renegade Games has an awesome app on our Tech on the Table episode, I think I mentioned using it for Clank. Well, in it, there's a module for Fuse. And all it does is it's a 10-minute timer. But it has a – you're on a spaceship that's about to blow up. That's a theme in Fuse, and you're trying to defuse a bomb. Well, this has like a GLaDOS-like AI that makes fun of you as you're playing. It's like, oh, I guess I didn't need that port in a cell. And it just – oh, aren't you going to speed up and so on, which surprisingly – adds a lot of tension to the game as you were playing because you have 10 minutes. Um, this is your rolling dice, your drafting dice. You're trying to put dice on cards. And when the cards are filled, you draw new dice, get through the whole deck to win crazy, fun, fast, stressful game. We played first on the tutorial level and actually won, which doesn't happen a lot in Fuse. And then we tried on normal level and got oddly destroyed. Well, you know, don't mess with GLaDOS. She will get you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, then last, uh, the other thing is he said he wanted really thematic games, right? Uh, it, not heavy, but interactive thematic games. So I broke out Fallout. Soon as he spotted Fallout on my shelf, he's like, oh, is that Fallout game any good? So cue to running game events. If you see someone doing this and looking at your game shelf, they're probably interested in the game they want to play. Well, now that they're, they're, they're going to hurt themselves looking at your game room shelves. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> yes. Uh, I really dig this game when it works. Uh, follow has a fantastic encounter system where you sit there and seed a couple decks and there's one deck when you explore settlements and another deck when you explore the wasteland and then there's quests and the quests you like read off cards and you can do there's multiple choice you can go do this or this and then when you do it you have this deck of like 200 cards and you use that to seed new things so what you do at the beginning of the game could come back for good or bad at the end of the game it is extremely well done and does a really good job of recreating some of the feel of the video game the problem is about a quarter of the time now i would say someone gets screwed like they roll bad they get die over and over they do a bunch of encounters but get terrible loot it just it seems like there's this death spiral and it's no fun for that one player like the first time it happened it was um Inchi games and i were playing uh on our anniversary and it happened to and we're like, wow, oh, man, sorry, that was a bad game for you. You know, let's play again. And it didn't happen again. Like, okay, it was a fluke, right? Whatever, bad rolls or maybe we made a mistake. Like, maybe I played that badly. Then it happened again. And then we're like, huh. Then the third time, I'm like, okay, this isn't good. And that's what happened to Bill. So here's this new gamer out, and he's all hyped about Fallout. And he's like, yeah, I don't think I need to buy that game. Because Bill sat there with nothing. Well, Joe, another player, I think, had seven weapons he had picked up. And was like, I guess I go back to the town to sell them to get more caps because I got nothing better to do. Hmm. So it, it, it's 
a little broken, like the, that 25% chance, like take your chance playing, but realize that you're playing four players. There's a chance one of them may have a bad time. Now there is an expansion out. I haven't checked this out. If, if that fixes it, fantastic. If anyone out there knows if the follow expansion helps fix this problem, please let me know. Cause if you tell me it does, I'll pick it up. Cause I really like the game except when it doesn't work. Well, now I just need to get down to Windsor again so that I can try Fallout before you get completely disenchanted and sell it off. <laughs> or, or auction it off at... Or auction, yeah. <laughs> you might have to get here before November 3rd for that one. Yeah, well. Uh, we record the show live every Wednesday night at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games, for looking after things for us. And we have a busy night tonight. Wow. Awesome. We are we Fantastic. are crowded in there. A lot of conversations going on. Uh, we've got a question from yep. one of our new, uh, Mr. Uncle Awesome. Uh, I don't know how detailed we're willing to we'll handle this right now. You know, some people have already given uh, some answers in the lobby. But uh, what is your favorite newish game to play with people just getting into the hobby after games like Catan and Ticket to Ride? Newish. Ooh, that makes it hard. Uh, Next up, games from Catan and Ticket to Ride. I think Carcassonne, I think St. Petersburg, uh, one we just mentioned. I think a fantastic game called Sink Terre is, is an awesome one, like spelled French, uh, which is all about delivering goods and villages and uses a lot of the mechanics from Ticket to Ride, but it's a step up. But none of those are really new. Um, I would lean towards Terraforming Mars, one of my favorite games of all times. Stick to the non-corporate wars rules, just stick to the basic game. Um now totally lighter game instead of a next step but a sideways step is azul and sagrada so you've got more abstract games uh there are many others but again as mentioned that may I, we are adding that to our topic list uh, it's not the first time we've been asked for a next step question mm -hmm. if you check out we had an episode where we answered three questions where i talked about the next step to splendor speaking of which splendor splendor would be a good step up from those and also, just pick up Duke, because you should have Duke. Yes, the Duke is a great game. Though it's not really... A, it's two-player only, so it I is. don't really lump it with Catan and Ticket to Ride, but... No. But you should uh, have Dark Duke and Azul anyway. Dark Wolf recommends Orléans and Above and Below. I agree on Above and Below. I don't think Orléans is good for players who have only played Ticket to Ride and Catan. I think that would kind of blow their minds. A little, a little um, advanced, maybe. Istanbul would be a good one. Istanbul, the dice game we mentioned earlier, would be even better, because it's Absolutely. much easier to teach. Really quick to pick up. Uh, would you recommend that Karuba we had talked about before? Um, Karuba, I still, I still feel it was for young, younger. Okay. <laughs> I, I just, young, I, not, I, young, yeah, not inexperienced. Yeah, I, I still think that needs to be kids games. Okay, sounds good. Uh, as usual, continue to ask your questions. We may or may not get to them on the show, uh, but we will put them on our list of questions and potentially answer them on the blog and potentially do a full episode on them. As mentioned last time, we have officially launched our very first giveaway. That's right. Yesterday, I published my review of my shiny new License to Slay that I received in the mail from the Bureau of Dragons. The day before, I gave everyone a sneak peek on our Twitch channel which you can also now check out on YouTube. Now, I really recommend you check out the video on YouTube or Twitch to see this product in, in person and to hear Mo's take. This is a very cool product, uh, and it would make any gamer happy, especially as a gift. I know it would be fantastic. I have to say, I was a little, uh, you know, hesitant when I first heard about it, but last time I was down, I got to see it, and uh, the quality of it was much better than I expected. I think even in, in the description, I originally heard about it. I was like, well, that sort of sounds like somebody with a inkjet printer in the basement, and it really was. Well, it was. It's there. There's. It, it's printed. No. No arguments yes. there. But uh, the quality of the materials is yeah. next level compared to what I was expecting. Hearing something like that. Yeah, I agree. The, what it is, it's a it's a cool piece of fantasy gamer bling, right? It's something cool to have in your game room, show off to your friends, carry the license in your in your pocket, right? You get an envelope stamped with a seal from the Bureau of Dragons, a welcome letter, a hand-stamped personalized letter, and then the license itself. Now, the license is the coolest part. It's a thick card, some cool flavor text on the front, my name and a number on it, and then the um, Bureau logo. 
It looks very official, but then the back just blew me away. It's this, like dark blue with a reflective silver logo on a field of blue that's like embossed with scales. I, I'm really impressed by this thing, actually. It's it's not one of those business cards you get for you know five hundred for nine ninety nine. <laughs> no, not at all. For those uh, watching us on Twitch, I don't know how well you can see this because I can't yeah, see no. my own video. Uh, that but, that's pretty bright, but yeah, the back shows up nicely. There you go. All right, so head over to tabletopbellhop.com to check out the full review, including some high-res photos you can click to enlarge. After you've checked out the full review, scroll down and you'll find a Rafflecopter contest entry form where you can enter to win your own license to slay. It's a pretty typical contest entry, you know, tweet, check our Facebook page, follow us on social media platforms, sub to our newsletter, all the usual stuff you find on online blog and podcast contests. The contest is running for three weeks. From uh, from its start and will close on August. No, the contest is running for three weeks from start and will close on October thirtieth. November third and fourth, myself and a bunch of local gamers from Windsor will be gaming for more than twenty four hours in support of Extra Life. This supports the Children's Miracle Network hospitals. The gamers of Windsor have raised fourteen thousand dollars over the last five years. With no plan on slowing down. Not at all. To find out more info on what we're doing and how you can help us out, head over to www.windsorextralife.com. That's W-I-N-D-S-O-R-E-X-T-R-A-L-I-F-E.com. You can get that spelling on the blog as well. Now, what would be a big help to us is spreading the word. When you see Mo sharing information about the event online, on Twitter, Facebook, or G+, or MeWe, like, comment, and share. Now, you can find us all across the web. All across the web. You can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. In fact, we're over a 1,000 downloads now on our podcast. Awesome. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform. Give us a like, comment, or review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google, or wherever you find us. And help us spread our gaming advice to the world. Not that I'm an Apple fanboy or anything, but reviews on Apple Podcasts really do help. That helps us show up on searches when people search for gaming podcasts, tabletop podcasts, gaming advice, and so on. Absolutely. There are top ratings lists, uh, and they are for every country. So, uh, you know, whatever country you're in, head over to Apple Podcasts, drop us a a star rating and or a review, and it makes a difference in uh, how we show up. Now, if you stream mm-hmm. on Twitch and are interested in a mutual hosting agreement, we would love to hear from you. We host you, you host us, and everyone wins. Just contact Mo at tabletopbellhop.com and we can set something up. Now, you can sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and everything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. We also have a G-plus community for now until next summer. Uh, It has a section for questions. I'm on Twitter pretty much all day. You can DM or at me there. Uh, Head over to our Facebook page. Hit us up there. We'll take your questions anywhere and everywhere. We want you to be able to reach us. Now, Shadzar, who can be frequently be found in our Tabletop Bell Room Pop Live lobby, including right now, asks, (laughs) have tabletop games become so saturated that there is nothing left to make? And will they turn anything into a tabletop game? And is there a list of worst tabletop games or ones that should never exist? Like this new one released by Mattel, Flushing Frenzy. So let's talk about the first bit. So saturated, there's nothing left to make. I honestly don't think so. The sheer number of new games that are coming out every year, like it's it's a staggering amount. And each of these new games is trying to do something different. Maybe not a lot different or sometimes groundbreaking, but thousands of games coming out that always are doing new things, new ideas. Like the numbers are crazy. 
now, like, this is the same argument where people are like, oh, they're not going to make any new movies. They've run out of ideas or no one's going to have anything to write books about. Now, it's cheaper and more profitable for a company to use existing product lines. Same as to make games, movies, TVs. They don't need to generate the, the original material. Right. It's already extant. So they can just pump it back out there and make a profit. But there is still a whole world of fiction and imagination out there to be developed. And Correct. it just needs to be tapped so if you go over to the blog, I posted a ton of facts about this. Like I actually did some research stuff like the fact that there were 3,500 plus new games released in 2017 and that that number has been climbing by about 30% a year since the year 2000. Just head over to the blog to look at this stuff. Like it is insane. The number of games out there. And if they were all coming out with the same game and everyone put it, the industry would have crashed by now. There would be no new games to play. And we'd all just be playing Terraforming Mars, Terraforming Mars 2, Terraforming Venus, Terraforming Europa. Like, it's that's not the case. That's not happening. Now, the law of averages comes in here. So when you've got 3,500 games out there, some of them are going to be garbage. But yes. there are also going to be some real golden and fresh material in there. The problem we've got right now is a you've got the big companies marketing their stuff. And a lot of the times, again, because of the ease, it's going to be stuff that's already existent and it's going to be a rehash. And then your other problem is Kickstarter, where the people who know how to market it properly win. You can have mm -hmm. the best game in the world, but if you haven't got the correct method of marketing on Kickstarter and getting your, your name out there, it doesn't matter what your game is like. Uh, you might not see a dime and you may never hit the market. Correct. So now the second part, is there a list of the worst tabletop games? Well, when you Google it, there's many, but I'm guessing he wants to know what I think are the worst games. Well, that does seem to be the theme of the show, you know, and you are the tabletop bellhop. You've got to hold up your end now that I've stopped breaking our stream. <laughs> So one of the things I'm going to note here is I didn't really want to do this. And she games the one that pushed it. I am all about promoting the hobby, promoting the industry, promoting gaming and getting gamers together, playing tabletop games. That's what I do. That's who I am. I really don't like to knock things down. I would much rather focus on the positive than the negative. Now, Anchi Games pointed out, for one, the argument I had last week about people needing to know what I like to know if we're on the same page is just as true for the games I don't like. Plus, it, as she said, is good for, um, I don't know, not SEO, but people want to know. People like to hear about the games you don't like. People like bad news, I guess. I don't know. People like to focus on that. So not only should this be a popular podcast, it also... Um, there is a good reason for it because then people will know my taste better. So when I do make recommendations on what games you should get after Catan and Ticket to Ride, you know if you can trust my opinion. So fair enough. I did it. I wrote the blog post. I'm here talking about it now. But in general, I would much rather push games up than knock them down. Which means that we're going to try and avoid all of the current poop and pimple-based games. Yes. Because any game that has the tagline, where number two always wins isn't yeah. really going to be covered by this podcast. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to skip those easy targets, right? Like we're going to skip Fleshing Frenzy or the new game that came out called Step On It. I Don't even look it up. Just stop. Like I could go to Toys R Us right now. Yes, we can still do that in Canada. I can go to Walmart and I could just grab a pad and write down all the games on the shelf, come here and just list those off because they're probably all that bad. I could find tons of bad games. It's too easy. But what I want to talk about are games I've actually played and more so games that I played thinking I would enjoy them and then ended up I did not. At Amazon.com, if you just type in anything gross, it will give you yeah, a list game. of frequently bought together games uh, that all that all match up. It's it's just it's super low hanging fruit. So in the spirit of uh, boosting the signal, what are the games that you thought you would enjoy but didn't? All right. So number one, and I have gotten a ton of flack for this one, is a game called Senator. This is a small box silver line game that is kind of poker mixed with an auction game. And it's kind of like Love Letter and the fact that it's a micro game because it's a trick-taking game where you only have seven card hands. 
Now the seven hard hands, everyone has the same cards. And then there's only four types of cards. There's two plus ones, two zeros. Um, I, I don't even remember all of them. And like a plus five and then an assassin or something. Now, like with that few cards, how good a trick taking game can you have? Like, you know what everyone has. And then the really dumb one is this one card called an assassin. And if anyone plays an assassin, the entire hand's wiped. No one gets anything. Like you just threw in a skip a turn mechanic into drafting. Like I don't get it. Like why? Like we're tense and oh, did he play his zero or his plus two? I'm going to play my plus two. Oh, someone assassinated it. Like, and then you're drafting to get like supposedly things to go through the Senate laws. And then you're trying to do set collection with those. And then some of those let you break the rule. I don't know. I, I honestly, we had, we tried to play this with a, a large group at a new year's party. And it was so bad that it became a meme in our group. We didn't know the term meme then, but like anytime people were like, what do you want to play? Like, Oh, let's play Senator. And everyone's like, yeah, Senator. Oh God, no. Right. Or we'll be comparing bad games. We're like, Oh, is it Senator bad? Like it's a thing in our group. Then what blew me away is when I was doing research, this is written by Eric Lang, like the guy that wrote blood rage and, and, uh, rising sun and, chaos in the old world like this guy's an awesome developer and makes awesome games i have no idea what happened with senator and since posting this on the blog i have gotten so much feedback that senator is some people's favorite game so i don't know what i missed but we had no fun with this game it was i think the first game i ever purged out of my collection because as my collection grew until i ran a room i just wanted them on the shelf to look pretty senator went now how many people did you play with I th think it was four. It might have been six. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Because it's supposed to be it a was, three it to five. Reason. It was supposed to be three. Uh, apparently it's three to five and five is the, is the ideal. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the ratings, um, it seems like there really is a kind of mixed message on this. It drops down right in the middle, mostly because people aren't sure about it. So there's, there's love and hate for this game. Uh, so I don't think you're the only one who dislikes it, right. but there are definitely some people who like it as well. I've, I've seen some of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, your crazy comments <laughs> coming <Yes>. along. <laughs> some, some rather passionate comments. Yep. Yeah, and that's but fine. You know what? Not for me. Yeah. It's for you. Great. I have no problem with that. There are that probably is something people I, who I, like, don't step in it too. So more power to them. Yeah, maybe. I, I should have added that at the beginning. Disclaimer, I may mention a game you love. That doesn't mean I don't love you, right? Like, I have nothing. If you don't like, if you love some of these games, all the power to you, have fun, play them. Just if you invite me to play, I'll probably say no. I'm sure there are games I love. You're like, oh my God, how does he play that? So, right, so now I've got another disclaimer admit, to record for uh, the beginning of this episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll admit the rest of these games on here are way lower than Senator. Like, Senator's maybe there's some good there i missed i don't think there's much of that with the rest so up next is a game called lone wolf and cub game now this is based on the old graphic novels now back in the day in windsor i mentioned this i think our last episode there was a place called leisure world and this place was a hobby store and it was the first place i got my first hobby game talisman and talisman had a little sign on it that said from the makers of talisman they had other games and i bought those and i talked about dungeon quest a whole bunch last week and what i decided in my little kid brain was that that box must be like that size of box that avalon hill bookcase game means good game so i was like oh sweet all the games that look like this must be good i'll buy this lone wolf and cub game it looks like a cool comic series i'd never read it so I get it home and I break it out and it looks fantastic. Like it's got this map of Japan and you make a character and you have a character sheet and you have these combat cards. And then I go to read the Boer book and I couldn't tell you exactly where it is, but there's a paragraph that doesn't end here. And then the next chapter starts there. That is the section on how to make your character. The fact you can't make your character means you can't play the game. Now, we talked about this in our Tech at the Table episode, episode 7. Back then, there was no internet. I couldn't go online and find the missing rules. This just meant I had a box I couldn't play. It looked pretty. Game could not be played. That rated it a zero on Board Game Geek because I can't play the game. Yeah, this one this one doesn't fare as kindly on Board Game Geek as uh, as Senator does. Uh, the, the overwhelming majority on, on this opinion on this game is unkind yes uh and, and i have to say looking at the uh the contents of the box 
It's definitely got that nineteen late nineteen eighties feel to it. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's very. It, it looks good for the day. Yeah, it's it's very dated for what we expect from a game nowadays. Yeah. So the next game I would actually say is worse than Lone Wolf and Cub, and you can play it. This is a game called Tchulcha. We call this Murder Story. Uh, it's something about an Etruscan purification ritual. You have eight pawns and you roll two D six. And if you roll doubles, you add a third D six, you pick one of those, you assign it to each pawn and they move that far around a circular track, trying to get to a central space where they score at the end of the game. If you land on someone, here's where the story thing comes in. You should send them back or something. No, in this game, when you land on something, you have to determine your spiritual strength versus their spiritual strength. And if your spiritual strength is high enough, you overpower them and you murder them and hide the body in the forest, as far as we can tell. Now, if enough of your pawns are murdered, you can declare allegiance to Tchulcha. Now, Tchulcha is the god of destruction in the, the Etruscan... Uh, hierarchy and then if you're that player who's lost enough people to sell their soul to the god of destruction your goal changes to kill everyone else now if you're one of the pl other players and you don't want to be killed you can become the lassa vacuvia and if you're the lassa vacuvia you have to steal the four gates and if you do that you wit what like what what the hell it, it's sorry, you're rolling and you're moving around a circular board, getting your guys to the middle and you split the dice up between each. Like it's so, so I don't even know. It, it is like literally one of the worst games I have ever played. Yeah, I recognized some of those word you, words you used, but the order you were putting them in doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, interestingly, uh, if you Google Tchulcha, uh, Warhammer 40k comes up because the Tchulcha yeah, engine the is name. an ancient sentient device, impossible warp entity. So at least there that, are some that good things that come game. from the name. The, that yeah, might have been the game, game is the warp entity itself. I, I think it is. <laughs> like like you're you're playing sorry or trouble and you're murdering guys and they go in this forest and you can't ever recover from the forest. Like oh my god, it's it's unbelievably bad. It's and it's an odd looking board too. It's yeah. Um, up next, Skyline 3000. So I couldn't tell you how many years ago. It's it's a while back. It might even been before my kids were born. There was these two warehouse stores just like popped up in vacant big box buildings at the either end of Windsor. And we walked in there at one point because someone on Facebook was like, oh my God, check this out. They had piles of board games, mostly Z-Man games. And they were five bucks each or four for 20. I bought every game they had, and then I went to the one on the other end of town, and I bought every game they had. It was pretty cool. Now, most of the games were good. There was a fantastic game, Steffenfeld Speaker Stat, which is a great game. Long out of print, re-released now as Jarl. Um, they, they were, they're decent games. Now, Skyline 3000 was not one of those decent games. This looks like Sin City in space, which should be awesome, but no. This is like a super basic area majority card that has the dumbest auction system I've ever seen, where you have to take your cards and you have to put cards on top you're spending, then the auction you want to play under those, and then you take all your cards in a stack and hold them out to all the players, and you slowly slide them off as you count down to see who gets to their card like it's just overly complicated dumb auction system then when you flip it over you get to do your thing which is either stack up buildings higher put roofs on buildings to say they're done or put them on the board and then you do that until everyone's out of buildings and then you see who has the most buildings in each area and whoever has the, then you get points for it and you win and then there's also billboards and i have no clue why there were billboards and we played it three times at extra life whatever year that was. No, kids must have been born if it was that extra life. Um, so we played at extra life, and I remember three times finishing the game, and it's people going, wait, what was the billboard for? Because we just never figured it out. Like, it looked like a neat game, but, like, it just, no. It's it not. So, yeah, there's, there's again, it's a, it's, it's a slightly above midline. Now, it's actually a re, uh, redesign of the game Capital from uh, Saw that. of Rome. Uh, is that one you've played? Is it? It, no, it, it ranks. It ranks a little higher, but not that much. So it's hard to. Skyline's a little higher, or capital? No, capital. Runs capital ranks a little <laughs> higher. Capital hits a six eight. Uh, there you go. Where board game uh, Skyline's uh, closer to a six. So yeah, see, Skyline a five on board game geek is kind of like it's a board game. 
is kind of the rating. Like at a five, it's like, yeah, it's a game. I'll, it, it, it was okay. Yeah. Like once you get to six, like, yeah, I'll play it now and then. So anything that rates like five point something, you're like, yeah, it's barely a board game. That's at least that's how I read the ratings. Yeah. There's uh, you know, the, the last comment was gave it away. So right there, yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's, I donated my copy to Extra Life, and I think it raised way more money than the $5 I spent on it that went to the kids, which Fair is enough. awesome. Fair enough. And to be honest, I bet you this year at the auction, whoever bought it will be giving away a copy of Skyline because that's what I seem to see with that game is every Extra Life, the people get it and bring it back out because, well, it's not that great. So next is another one I am going to get flack for, yeah. although I haven't yet. I expect it to, and that is Werewolf slash Mafia, that stupid big con game where a bunch of friends get together and you hand out a random roll to people and you supposedly role play, but then you basically pick someone random to get out of the game so they can't play with the rest of you, which is usually the guy you don't like, or it's the really popular person because everyone laughs when they get kicked out. Like, how, how is this a fun game? It's it's more based on popularity. Like, I get later in the game, you can do some deduction, right? You can be like, oh, this person must be the seer because of this, or this person must be, I don't know the mafia roles, I know the werewolf one's better. This person's got to be a werewolf because that night, this person, like, there's, there's, you can figure it out. But, like, those first round, probably first five rounds, it's, like, random. Like, I, I just... I don't get it. I don't understand why this game's so popular. You can go to any con probably in North America and late at night you'll find a group playing Werewolf or Mafia. You just won't find me playing it. And I mean, to be fair, the people may not be complaining because you've made your feelings about this particular game or yeah. genre of game pretty clear. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I, I won't be surprised if we hear a, a lot of its supporters stepping up and, uh, and defending it. And that's fine. Again, your game, your favorite game doesn't have to be everybody else's. That's true. Like, I, I, to each their own. Yeah, they did put out the one night versions. I'll play those. Those I rate like a six. I'm like, if people are like, oh, we're all going to play one night werewolf. I'll be like, oh, okay, I guess. Because I don't want to sit and play something by myself. I just, I don't get it. I don't understand. Maybe we won't get the flat. Because every time I've told someone that actually does enjoy it, they're like, oh, I've never been knocked out the first round. You know, oh, so you're that person who <laughs> manages to stay in until the end. So, of course, it's fun for you. Anyway, moving on. Everyone knows my feelings on Werewolf. Now they're out there even louder than before. Up next, Snarf Quest, the card game, based on the graphic novel from Larry Elmore. This is something I haven't read in years, but I remember when I was a younger kid or probably young adult, I loved it. It was it was hilarious. It probably makes way too many chainmail bikini jokes nowadays to be as... Um, Popular is probably not the right word. Maybe probably has problematic content yeah. in it that many as not much PC of anymore. Stuff. Yes, exactly. That's my guess. I don't know. Maybe it's still fantastic. No, no, but anyway, it's not, back it's in not. the day. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my guess. Uh, back in the day, though, I was really into the comic and they put out a game and I'm like, that's awesome. So I get this card game and it, it sounds awesome. It's like, oh, the players must work together to make Snarf have this epic quest and you're going to explore territories and meet the characters from the books and you're going to work together with the robot and the chick in the bikini or whatever. But all it is is you deal out like 10 cards in a, like in a row and then you put Snarf, it's a nice metal miniature, there was one bonus, on it, and, and then on a player's turn, they move Snarf one square card left or right, and then they do what's on the card. Now, this is where the adventure is supposed to happen, but all the card is is, like, take treasure or steal treasure from the other players or move Snarf an extra spot or manipulate the card row. And then the other thing you can do is then players seed the ends of this timeline. Like, it's it was not epic. I didn't feel like I was moving Snarf on an epic quest. I felt like I was playing a bad take that game with a cute miniature. And and to be honest, those miniatures have not aged well. No. Uh, they were cute at the time, but uh, they are not the sort of quality we one expects from, from modern miniatures. Yeah. Um, they were, different, you know, problematic. <laughs> Let's just say that. But it's Snarf Quest. You want it to be good because Snarf Quest was good. Uh, but even the quality of the cards. I mean, it's, yeah, there, it's, it's, it's the game is dated. Very, very dated. Its mechanics are dated. And if you were a huge Snarf Quest fan at the time the game came out, you might have enjoyed it briefly. But then I, it went on a shelf and got put away. I don't. Need, I think this is one that like you're not going to enjoy it despite the license. It just there wasn't enough game there. And, and talking about fives, it's a five-two. <laughs> yeah, it's barely a game. Barely a game, yep. So the next one I almost want to put to the end because this one 
let's bump. Let's, let's, getting let's a, bump let's, it back. It's, we've got a lot to talk about, so we'll bump it and we'll we'll jump ahead to uh, to Penny we are going to jump ahead. Okay, yeah, let's jump so, ahead to Penny Arcade. Because yeah, that one that one's yep. generating a lot of buzz, complete different buzz than from the other one. Yep. So up next. I scrolled too far, is Penny Arcade, Paint the Line, the expandable card game, the Red Tide Starter Set. I honestly have no idea where I got this game. I don't know. I don't remember. Like, if it was a review copy or something. I know I was doing a bunch of reviews on the WGR around that time period. So this is a ping-pong-based collectible card game. Like, buy booster packs kind of card game set in the 70s Cold War, where Gabe and Tycho are going to stop the nuclear war through table tennis. I Whatever. Okay. Odd. I, I'm sure it had to do with something they were doing on their comic strip at the time. Uh, it's a card game where you're doing table tennis. So one player is going to play a serve card, and then the other player is going to try to play a return card. And each of your characters have special abilities. But then it throws in a d20 to hit roll. So when I play my serve card, I got to roll to see if I had a good serve. And then when the opponent plays their return card, they got to roll to see if they returned it properly, which made it far too random. Like, so many times, it was just, yeah, I missed my serve. It's your serve. Oh, I hit my serve. Oh, I missed my return. Like, it just, like, if it was a 15-minute filler game, and you're like, quick, f fast battle of hitting ping pong balls back and forth to save the world from nuclear war, that might have been cool. But this was like an hour to an hour and a half game. Like, it just not enough there. Like, I guess there's no other ping pong games out there, so that's kind of cool. Now, if you are a huge Penny Arcade fan, and I got to admit, I do dig those guys. They've done a lot of fantastic things for the game industry. Check out the Penny Arc. It's just called Penny Arcade the Game, Rumble and Rilia. It's a solid deck builder where the Penny Arcade guys are fighting Cthulhu. All right. Well, I, you know, when I first read, your, read the show notes on this and saw what game was coming up, my first thought was, but you love ping pong. Well, you're <laughs> playing ping pong all the time. And now you describe it, and I think... Why the hell would anyone play a card game oh, of ping exactly. pong? Uh, now, to be honest, though, I could see this developed into a Wii game. Oh, yeah. It's actually a mechanical. So you, you take you take the powers and everything and you throw it into an actual physical mechanic of playing ping pong. Then you've got a game. But card based sports don't really work. No, I, well, mean... <laughs> I, I disagree with that because there's some good ones out there. But like Blood Bowl Team Manager is fantastic. Baseball Highlights is good. We could do a whole episode on good sports games. Well, yeah, but, 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 but now team, Kong... team Manager and playing the game are, are different, right? So this yes. is the physics. This is actually the physics of hitting a ball with a paddle, not yes. managing your team or, or setting things up. And, and that's where I see the differences. The actual physical mechanics of playing a game don't make a game... A card right. game work for me. To me. All right. All right. Another one I got flack on, though not as I got more I didn't get flack complaining about this game now, but I've gotten flack about complaining about this game in the past. This is an extremely popular game with a small group of people called Container. Now they just released the tenth anniversary, and there are a ton of people out there going nuts over the fact this game is back out, and I don't get it. So one of the things I've organized over the years, being the game ambassador here in Windsor, is something called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz. This is a multiple round board game tournament where people are going to play games and get points based on how they rank in each game. This year, I organized the event, but we didn't have quite enough players, so we got everyone's permission. And I played games as well as organizing it. It was all above the table. Everyone knew what was going on. So... We played all day and we got to the fourth round and four of the players, including myself, were tied. So literally whoever won the next game was going to win. And now we could have metagamed it. So we were all at four different tables playing against different people and trying to do it. But we decided we're like, screw it. Let's sit down together, the four of us, and make this a real match. The four top players playing against themselves. Whoever wins this game wins the whole tournament. And to make it better, to make it so we really duked it out, we wanted to play a game none of us had ever played before. So not only are we playing a board game tournament, testing our skills, we've got to learn a brand new game. 
So the board game organizer, Mark Langtot, comes over and he's like, all right, I got this game container. It's my favorite game. It's from a Canadian developer. You can't get it. It's out of print. It's amazing. You got to play this. We're like, all right. So he teaches us to play. And in this game, it's an economy where you're, I don't even remember all the little bits, but like someone's producing goods. Someone's making machinery to refine the goods. Then you're shipping the goods. And you can't do any of the things yourself. So any goods you make, you can't refine. And any of the game goods you refine, you can't ship. So it has to do with interacting with the other players. So if I make the goods, I have to ship them to someone else and they have to refine them. And then someone else has to take them from there and ship them. While we played, like we were tense, right? Like we're competing here. We were stingy. Like we were like, I'm not buying those goods. And I'm like, well, I'm not producing those because you'll just refine them. And well, I'm not going to like when the ships go, there's an auction to see who gets the containers on the ships when they go to the island. Well, we we're bidding like starting bid seven bucks, which is less than the value. And everyone's like, no, pass 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 like it was terrible and as the game went on there's an in-game economy and that's supposedly one of the bonuses of the game is that the players control the market well it spiraled we literally ran out of money and couldn't produce any goods so no one could win the game and mark comes over like mark come on over like what what the heck are we doing he's like what'd you do i'm like i don't know he's like i think you broke the game and now this was the time of the internet, so someone had their cell phone, and they Googled it, and multiple threads on Board Game Geek talk about the container death spiral. I think they actually called it a whirlpool, because you're ships, right? So all these threads, like, half the people are like, it's terrible, it's broken. The other half are like, no, no, it's a brilliant game, because the players have to work together to develop the economy before they can exploit it. That's just dumb. Like, I get it, but tell me that in the rules and build a game that makes me do that, that makes me build the economy. Like, have phase one economy building, phase two economy exploitation. Like, I found it a completely broken game. Like, no thanks. I have no interest in playing that game again. So we played it. Sorry, I did play again because we played a second round and it was dumb. Like we sat there and just like, Oh, I guess I bid 50 for your container of 30, even though I don't really want it. So we can build the economy. Like it, it was bad. We, we passively aggressively played the game a second time. I have no interest to play it again. Now what's funny is when I mentioned this most recently, instead of someone telling me I'm wrong, they pointed out that since then this new 10th anniversary has a letter from the designer where they admit this was a problem and the expansion has a variant that fixes this. I'm sorry at this point container, I've given up on you. I don't care that your designer finally admits there was a problem with his game. Now there was, uh, I believe a second printing at one point before the 10th anniversary. Um, so, he may have fixed it before that. I but, think we played the second printing. But the, I mean, this game is a seven-one. It's I mean, it That's, has a lot like of fans. It. This game yep. has a lot of fans. So I mean, I guess people are giving it a pass because it has been fixed and they have found I, the fix. No, I don't think it's that. I think it's the people who like playing it when it was broken. They like this building the economy. Supposedly, it's one of the best economic simulations in board game form. If that's what you're into, and if you know, if you own 20 warehouses in Windsor, maybe you know that you have to sit there and support the shipping lanes or else your warehouses won't thrive. But as three, four board gamers sitting down, we didn't have this knowledge and we broke the economy. Right. Like people dig it and like people dug it before. So, so yeah. I, I don't think it's the, the fix. I just think there's yeah. people who like this game and people who don't. Yeah, it, seem, it seems, uh, seems like, I mean... It, the, the general opinion is that it's it's, it's a strong yeah. game, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Next up. All right. Up, next up, Cards Against Humanity. Uh, you know what? I'll admit it. I laughed the first time I played this game. I laughed enough I cried. Second time I played, I also laughed a lot. I, I had fun. Third time, it just wasn't as funny, and then I started to realize how uncomfortable I felt with some of the cards that were coming up. Like, I, to be honest, I put a link on the web page that goes to a, um, an article that was put out about why, not me, but why I know I'll never play Cards Against Humanity again. I don't have the author's name in front of me, Badmo. But I, the sentiments on that are written better than I can explain it. The, the whole thing is it's a cheap trick. It, it's the lowest common denominator joke. Like, 
that style of game was already good and you could play apples to apples and in apples to apples it's funny because it's innuendo it's subtle there's actual jokes being made it's not just someone saying something i'd have to hit the bell seven times to say on the air because we're trying to be a rated g show it is it's just cheap tricks it's bad jokes it's white privilege it's making fun of things that shouldn't be funny if you want to play it in your basement, feel free, but it is the only game that is banned at any Windsor Gaming Resource event here in Windsor. There is, in my opinion, no reason to play this game. Yes, I feel guilty. I played it and had fun. I probably shouldn't have in retrospect now that I think about it. And uh, the author is Jaya Saxena, J-A-Y-A-S-A-X-E-N-A, uh, of Thank that article. You. Now, I have to say, you know, I, haven't, I actually haven't played Cards Against Humanity, but I've played some of the right knockoffs of it. And as a getting drunk in the backyard with a family sort of game, you know, it's it's fun. Um, yes, there are, there are probably white privilege, but again, I can't <laughs> live with a white family. Yeah. We laughed. We had a lot of fun. Um, playing it with my mother-in-law we made it really awkward. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, you know, again, no, I don't think this is a, you know, play at the FLGS, play at the con, play at the... But if you're having a bunch of drinks with your friends and that's the kind of game and kind of sense of humor you have? See, at this point, I, I see how people can find it fun, but I just think there's better alternatives that do the same thing. That's fair. I would, I would rather have the group be creative and come up with their own nasty jokes with an apples to apples or a game like that right. than have to have force-fed offensive bullshit to say. That's fair, and again, I, I I've only played knockoffs of it. I haven't played against. Yeah. I haven't played cards itself, so I can't I can't say exactly what the uh, what the comparison is. And All now right. and now we move on to that uh, that game in the background, that game that has brought up so much discussion every time it's mentioned or shown. Yes, uh, we probably should have saved this for its own episode. It ends up. So the first thing that is going to happen when I mention the name of this game is you're probably going to Google it. And then you're going to want to buy a copy. Don't do it. Seriously. I have tried to tell people this and every person who's done it has come back to me and went, oh, man, you were right. I am right. Don't do it. So this game is the Masters of the Universe role playing game from FASA. Yes, FASA, who made Battletech and the old Star Trek X RPG. Yes, experienced game company with good RPGs under their belt. Put out a Masters of the Universe, not only just a book, but a box set with maps and minis and tokens. It looks so awesome. But no, don't do it. It, it is so bad. It is, un, like, I'll get to it. All right, so first of all, it says role-playing. It is not in any way, shape, form, or type a role-playing game. It is a board game. It is a randomized loot on the board. Move your pawns into it. Flip the loot tokens over until you find, I forget what, but the thing, the, the MacGuffin, it's a set thing. Find the thing and get out of the dungeon with it. There is no role-playing to be done. There's no skills. There's just move your guy. Now, there's some neat stuff that sounds cool, like it's got, you see the board and you, um, when you walk into a room, you actually look up the name of the room and you roll a die to see what happens. And some actually have some like neat stuff in the rooms. Like there's a prison and there's a chance there's a prisoner in there. So each room has a kind of cool encounter, but like it, it sounds better. Now there, there's an AI, the AI is broken. Um, the rule books are, is in the form of a comic book where some eight year old kid gets sucked into Eternia to play this board game. Um, we started reading the rules and page one made no sense. And then like page two and by page three, it made even less sense. And then you get to a rule summary and the rule summary doesn't match anything you read on page one, two or three. Um, then you get to the back and there's stuff that sounds like it makes sense. And it's like, we'll never attack when on defense, but defends with attack. And you're like, what does that mean? Um, like here, here's another example. This is, I, this is for the people watching. I have the Orco card in front of me and you see all this stuff on here and you look at it and it looks like an RPG. Like there's RPG stats. So you look at it, and he's got strength, agility, intelligence, life force, and magic. He's got a list of skills. He's got five movement points and all these spells. Then he's got more spells over here. He's got magic points. There are no spells in the rule book. There is nothing about spells. There is only three stats. You have strength, movement, and life force. All the rest of this, nothing. 
There's nothing in that box that tells you what any of this other stuff is. Like, I have no clue. Like, and then at the bottom, he has special abilities, automatic, teleport, and fly. These act just like spells with no cost. There's no rules for spells in that book. Like, they're not there. And it's not even like there's a page missing. This is literally unplayable. Not in the way, like, that Lone Wolf and Cub was missing a page. No, this is written like it's playable. And, like, it should work. So we actually sat down and tried to play this. So I have a link on the blog. This goes back to my old Windsor Gaming Resource Forum. I think I did the review in 2016. It might have been older than that, 2013. Whatever, it's old. Where I wrote an actual play report where I get into this in more details. But the whole point is that it is unplayable hot mess that looks like it was supposed to be an RPG, but it's not. And like the contents of the box aren't worth it. You get some cheap D6s and some cool He-Man art, and that's about it. And you have what might look like an RPG, but a book that doesn't go with it. So when I did the original review, I dug into this because I'm like, what the heck? Like, why? Why do I have this? Like, I want to play this Orko. He looks kind of cool. Like, I want to be Ram Man and headbutt stuff, right? Like, I want to play an RPG. So it ends up that there was supposed to be two boxes. There was supposed to be an original box set and then a follow-up. The original box set was meant to be a board game. The second box set was supposed to be to turn that into a role-playing game. The problem is that second box never came. They found out it wasn't coming, so then tried to mash the rules together and just release the board game, but without like updating the character sheet so they only had the information needed for the board game. They even put out metal miniatures. Google it. They're fantastic looking. Those came out. You can go buy them. I would love to find some. That's grail items for me. But, uh, but it never went anywhere. There was just this failed box or this box of failure. Like, yes, as a collector's item, I've kept this. I don't plan on selling it. I think it's neat to own. But you don't need it. There's no reason. And if you do buy it, please do your players a favor. Leave it on the shelf. Don't take it down. Don't play it. Don't try. Just give up on it now. I know everyone I show it to is like, oh, my God, I want it. No, it's so, so bad. Um, check out my original WGR review. I go into a bit more detail. But this pretty much sums it up. So, English is bad for product instructions and even worse for a game manual. The only thing I can think of, I mean, aside from the, the split the split issue, the only other thing I can think of is that the manual and comic book were written by the same... You know, Asian animation team that did all the that, that did all the in, in between animations between the keyframes for the original TV show, stuck in some know. basement somewhere working for Rice. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe this is it, this was this was a a turnkey animation project back in the day. I mean, they did not do yes high high value animation. They did pay some studio almost nothing to do it, and. Except the art on the box wasn't done by that studio because that studio no. at least knew how to draw body proportions. And yeah, that the covers. body proportion of He-Man on that drives me crazy. <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 bad. It's, Chadzar says don't unshrink wrap it. Absolutely. Leave oh, if it you can find sealed. a shrink copy, I'd buy a shrink copy just put it on myself and yeah. I'll sell this one. Absolutely leave it sealed. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't know. FASA, as far as I know, was all North American writers. Like how that got through quality control. Like FASA writes good games. They're well, still in business. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, again, now this goes back to right at the top when we were talking about how some studios and things have to push out products and to sit to make money based on uh, existing IP. Now, the other thing you need to do is if you want to keep a license for <laughs> IP, you need to use it. So yes. the reason that Sony kept keeps having all the X Men and blah 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 is because they keep making movies, and the reason mm -hmm. they keep making all these crappy Spider Man it's movies keep it. is to keep the license. Because if they go seven years mm -hmm. without making one, Marvel gets Spider Man back. Now, I mean, that's a bad example because Marvel's getting it back anyway. But in general, yeah. if you have the rights to something and you don't use it, you lose those rights. And so it, this could have been a simple matter of Fast and needed to get that game out. Or they were going to lose some val what could have been valuable IP. Yeah. Now it turns out nobody ever. I mean, Masters may actually become a valuable IP again because they're about to release mm -hmm. a new movie. But yeah. no one really could have predicted that after the Dolph Lundgren one came out and killed the <laughs> IP completely. Oh God. Yes. 
I heard the relaunch was pretty good, but I never watched it. I gotta admit, like an RPG in the Master Universe Absolutely. world sounds awesome. The concept like, is fantastic. Their implementation, a complete and utter train wreck. Oh, so bad. So bad. So we have had so much chat going on in the lobby. This has been fantastic. Awesome. It's been great seeing everyone in here. We've had uh, up I saw 19 people in there. I'm not sure if it got Whoa. higher than that. Uh we're, wow. at, we're at 17 right now, minus a bot or two here and there. But uh, it's so great seeing people in there in the chat room and, and talking away about things. There's been uh, conversations about every one of these games. Excellent. So, thank you very much. Anyone and, yelling at me for hating their favorite game yet? No, not yet. But uh, as right, so. are, uh most people who have their miniatures collections are 90% still unpainted. I think yeah, unless, that's, you're that's a miniature, over there. unless you're a miniature painter, you've got a huge collection of miniatures that are mostly unpainted. Um, you've got your key pieces, and the rest uh, the rest are just for display. Uh, but it's been aw awesome seeing that happening, and, and uh, thanks for all the folks who've been following us and subscribing to us uh, throughout the episode and in between episodes, even. Awesome. So now, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on the topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on the gaming advice, where you will see this and other questions answered in game in blog form. And feel free to leave comments in the bottom, letting me know just how wrong I am. Be sure to send your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Just a reminder that Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of our question list. Now, speaking of Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Misdirected Mark, our brother podcast. Join Chris, Phil, and Bob as they talk gaming and game mastering, or more recently, game design. Brian Kurtz, thanks, but we still need an answer on that ad copy. Yes, please get back to me when I get that done. Duran Barnett, thank you, and thanks for asking that question on Twitter yesterday. I've added it to the list. Joe Swick, thanks for that support. Now one more shameless plug follow tabletop underscore deals on Twitter and other social media for some of the best deals on tabletop games I could find on the web. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. The doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media at tabletop bellhop. One word, drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and we'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the Pendo Suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. Namo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>